Energy Espresso stands as a captivating gateway, merging the pulsating world of energy innovations with the deeply ingrained culture of coffee. Every episode serves as a fresh brew of ideas, featuring thought-provoking discussions on the latest in energy technologies, sustainability efforts, and the global transition towards greener alternatives. We invite energy experts, innovators, and thought leaders to share their insights and visions for a sustainable future. Energy Espresso is more than just a podcast. It's a community for those passionate about making a difference and those eager to learn more about the energy that powers our world and the coffee that fuels our days. So join us on this journey and let's discover together the fascinating intersection of energy solutions and coffee culture, one episode at a time. The Energy Espresso Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. Power is complicated, especially during the energy transition. Navigating the process can be confusing, expensive, and difficult to manage. AMP's diversified contract power generation fleet delivers fully managed power with mobile assets ranging from 35 megawatts through 2.5 megawatts, with the objective to provide a utility-like experience. Others call their service leased power or rental power. AMP refers to our service as turnkey contract power. If your organization is in need of temporary or long-term mobile generation for completions, drilling, production, compression, or in-field electrification projects, look no further. Our team is here to deliver excellence. Innovative power delivered so you can focus on business. Contact our team today to learn more. Let's talk power and get amped. Well, we'll go ahead and kick off the podcast. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining the In Energy Expresso. My name is Dave Bosco, and I'm joined with Rodney from Caterpillar. Rodney, good to have you on the show, my yes. friend. Thanks for having me. This is great. Absolutely. So we're live here at the uh, Thrive Conference, and appreciate everybody joining us this week. Um, we're going to go ahead and start out with getting energized for this uh, for this discussion. And uh, what I'm really appreciative of is that Rodney sounds like he's he's pretty darn passionate about coffee. And uh, I think we're going to maybe broach some of the subjects we were talking about when we were initially getting into the conversation here. If you're good with that, Rodney. Yeah, let's go. Awesome. Well, let's try this uh, uh, coffee that we got here. It's an espresso from the uh, Barista Bros. And in all fairness, listen, I had, I had grand plans. I went to Waco uh, this past weekend uh, with my family and uh, stopped into a uh, little coffee shop called Dichotomy Coffee. And uh, Apex uh, Roasters is the uh, sister to their business. And uh, my cappuccino machine that I brought for the show here, because I thought I was going to try and elevate my experience for a couple of these first episodes, ended up failing. But I'll <laughs> tell you what, Caitlin... And Sam came in absolute clutch and saved the day. So cheers to both of y'all. So let's try this coffee. Well done. How do you like it with that lemon in it? That adds a nice um, element to it. You almost taste the citrus before it even hits your palate. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice experience. It's different. Thanks for introducing me. Absolutely. I'm glad that I can open uh, people's palates to a different experience. So I actually do that, as I was telling you, with a couple of different other citruses, too. Um, worth trying it out. doesn't have to be espresso. can be any coffee, and it just adds a different layer. So while we're on the coffee topic, yeah. uh, Rodney, you were sharing. You actually do a, a little bit of uh, coffee experimentation, if we can call it that, uh, yourself. Is yeah, that right? Definitely. Yeah, I love coffee. Why don't you so. tell us about that? Yeah, I've had a lot of coffee experiences, you know, not to unpack it all, but um, having um, loved coffee since college, you know, getting introduced to it, you kind of say, oh, well, where does this all go? And I've had the chance to go to Kona, Hawaii, visit coffee plantations, see how that's grown, how it's processed, how it gets into green beans. Then I'd done that, and my sister one year, she always likes to buy me creative gifts, mm -hmm. you know, and unique set apart things to remember her by and she got me a coffee roaster so it's an individual you can you can make about a pot's worth of 
coffee beans and you get them green, right. you pop them in. It's it's almost like a little mini uh, air popper for popcorn. Got it. And as they heat up, they start to pop and crackle and you kind of learn the bean. And uh, yeah, so if, if you were to ask me exactly what I like, I'm going to probably go with a cappuccino. Okay. That's my thing. And But most mornings, simple pour over, blonde roast, light roast, something along those lines. But yeah, it's great. Nice. That's awesome. That's really cool that you... Uh, you roast your own beans, and, you know, it's even neater that you can do it on, like, a almost a single pot-serving basis, right? So mm-hmm. you can try blonde one day, espresso roast, you know, whatever that may be that you uh, you prefer. That's that's a that's a really neat concept. I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah, they're not, they're not that much. It's kind of a hobby. That's why I said, uh, how deep down the rabbit hole do you want to go with your passion here of yeah. uh, coffee? I love it. But living, you know, I lived in the U.K. for a while, and they drink Nescafe Gold. Is considered a good cup of coffee there. Yeah, yeah. So you kind of learn to adjust your standards based on the uh, the culture you're hanging out with. So then you almost um, chew a little bit of the coffee as you're <laughs> drinking it, right? Get to make sure it's <laughs> boiling hot to fully dissolve the crystals, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Well, let's get into talking about about Rodney. So, you know, do me a favor, kind of share with me what what's your story uh, starting out. You know, whether it's your journey started in as a kid. Um, certain point in your life where you got into mechanical pieces of equipment, mm-hmm. engines, transmissions, and got into working at Caterpillar, man. I'm really under, interested in understanding kind of the story that drove you into this industry that we're in, which is heavy machinery, oil and gas, industrial applications. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So growing up in Illinois, um, just always had an affinity towards understanding the way things work. Always wanted to just tear apart toys and build stuff and things like that. So, you know, naturally growing up, started working on cars with with my dad and things like that. And said, this is what I want to do with my life, right? I want to work on cars. I want to design cars. I want to come up with cool new things. And uh, so went to university for that. Went to University of Illinois, mechanical engineering. And as I started, you know, winding down my studies there and looking at careers, I started interviewing with the big three, right? Yep. They recruit heavily. And I interviewed with all three of them and realized quickly that I don't think I want to work for them. Because I'd get into these interviews and it was very much about, you felt like just another cog in the wheel a little bit. And it wasn't about who you were as a person Sure. a lot of times. So interestingly, my first interview with Caterpillar sit down on campus. The guy looks at my resume and he goes, hey, I see you volunteer at a food kitchen. Tell me about that. And I was like, what interview starts like this? It's question number two, kid you not. He goes, I see you like Jeeps. What kind of Jeep do you have? And I said, oh, you know, I got an 86 CJ7. And he goes, oh, cool. He goes, I just got back from Moab. He had a Land Rover. He goes, I got all these pictures. For the next 25 minutes, we talked about off-roading and Jeeps. That was my first interview with Cat. That's awesome. And I was like, what kind of company is this? Um, You know, subsequent interviews got a little bit more uh, uh, standard, we'll say, from there. But it was always this, you're part of a family. uh, What you do matters. Who you are matters. Um, So got the opportunity to come work at Cat coming out of university. That's awesome. And so how did you get from, so when you initially went into Caterpillar, was that an engineering role? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And going into engineering, how did you get into product development and product management where, you know, uh, we talked a little bit at the Thrive Conference the other night at the batting practice and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you were involved in the release of the TH-55 into oil and gas, um, traditional mining transmission and uh, a couple of engine lines as well. How did you kind of figure out that I wanted to be Rodney in product management, product line management for CAD? Yeah, that's that's always a good question when we're talking career discussions with people. It's like, how do you know where you want to be five years from now? And honestly, I didn't have a plan. I was a little bit on the no plan plan. And, you know, I always encourage people to have intellectual curiosity, never say no, be willing to try new things, right? And yep. I'd say that's a lot of how I got to where I am. but. I started off in transmission design out of mm-hmm. university. So I came in, I was working on a unique new project for European application that we never actually ended up doing. Um, that got shelved. And uh, they came to me and said, hey, would you be an operations supervisor? Go out and run the factory. 
So I said, yeah, sure, I'll try that. So a couple years out there, leading a group, about 40, 40 folks, putting together large transmissions for mining, for big dozers, for wheel tractor scrapers, for wheel loaders, all this stuff, and just really learned how to you know, lead people. Mm -hmm. Lead people, actually, almost my parents' age type thing, because yeah. I was 23 at the time, and learned some life lessons along the way. Sure. Came back in out of that experience into a design role, working on torque converters, which is a component in the transmission. And, oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Caterpillar had, had the vision to say, we need to be in this frack transmission business. And so some leaders dropped some prints off on my desk and said, hey, you know, we need to get into this business. Let's hurry up and release these prints and get to production. And I kind of said, well, what's this for? And they said, a frack rig. Um, and our first iteration was actually a bit of a collaboration and IP we bought back from the outside. And so we released that. Uh, and at the same time, we launched a new project, which was 100% CAT content. Mm -hmm. And that became the TH55. So I was one of the original designers on that product back in 2005. That's awesome. And as we went through, that got released to, to field trials um, in 2007. And uh, my leader came to me and said, hey, um, you know, we're, you want to be a field follow engineer? I said, yeah, that'd be great. You know, got to start interacting with our dealers, our customers, the OEM, seeing how it was running an application, yep. which was wonderful. And then in, by about 08, they said, okay, we're in production now. Uh, would you go down to Houston, kind of business development uh, for this product? Because, you know, we're, we're the new guys. We'd never had anything like this before. We were traditionally an engine-only manufacturer or sure. an engine plus drilling, like drilling modules and, and gen sets. So I said, sure, let's go. And uh, really educating dealers, educating customers, getting to know how this industry really works yep. was fantastic. And, you know, I showed up in late 08. Uh, got hit with a hurricane a month after I show up, and then the, the Great Recession. And I thought, oh, man, I just moved to Houston, and this may not end so well, right? <laughs> so, but lo and behold, the shale revolution, you know, powered right through that. Yeah. It continued to expand, and all of a sudden, it exploded by, yes. by 2011. And the amount of hydraulic horsepower that was going out the door was unprecedented, right? No, you never was, see it again. That, that was that was an, that was a phenomenal time. Um, I remember I was in the transmission business uh, myself for off highway. Let's call it brand A. Yeah. Uh, at that time, and all of a sudden, you know, the the market just took a crap, right? And everybody was like, to your point, we're going to power through this, and the build cycle was insane. Yeah. And back ordered on components you couldn't get a new transmission new engine and i started seeing the th55 enter into the market i heard you know peeps of like the th48 i'm not sure yeah. if that was the original that was the original yeah. one i was referencing so, with the prints yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a transmission yeah, yeah. geek okay so <laughs> you know seeing that thing come into market and just it was this massive you know transmission but that's you know you look at unconventional hydraulic fracturing versus what you know granddad's frack was which you know my father-in-law did frack back in the 60s and it was straight vertical plug and perf essentially a little bit of stimulation on a well mm -hmm. and the intensity that was required because of the amount of you know pressure that was building up the gear ratios were a huge limiting factor obviously yeah. on other transmission products and that was very unique and to your point on getting close to the customer, understanding the application, like that's what I think a lot of product development misses out on. You almost design or spec a solution inside of a box, mm -hmm. but you got to listen to your customer at the end of the end of the day, right? Because they not operate the equipment better than anybody else. Yeah, and I think one of the things I often joke about inside the walls is let's make sure we're getting the VOC right. You yeah. know, the voice of the customer. Yes, and I'll say because we don't need the VOE, I'll be like, well. It's the VOE. It's the voice of the engineer. <laughs> Just because we say we can do something doesn't mean that's actually valuable to the customer or yes. solving the customer problem. Yes. It's got to be customer back, right? It's got to be what problem are we trying to solve here? And let's be really clear about that so that we know we're delivering a value story. Because yep. without that, we're not helping the industry get better. No. Right? That's absolutely true. No pun intended. Let's shift gears. Uh, <laughs> you're so, that's, that's bad. So... What gets Rodney out of bed in the morning? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I love my family. So that's always a good thing to get you going in the morning. Yep. Um, for sure. Secondly, you know, operating in the energy industry, uh, you know, we, we 
think about energy and in the energy industry, we understand the power of energy and having access to energy. And when you look around the world, and I've had the privilege to go around the world to go on mission trips, and you see people who don't have access to energy, it really is poverty. Yes. Right? And so Absolutely. the old story of like, you know, you're eating your food as a kid and your mom telling you, hey, there's starving kids in Africa, right? Well, you can't move food like that no. around the world. No. But when you think about energy and getting people access to affordable, reliable energy, that changes lives, right? It does. So I think that's what's so exciting about being in the energy industry. It's because you go, hey, global population's growing. Energy use per capita globally is growing, which is lifting people, right? Yes, it's lifting people is. up, which is a fantastic, like, reason to get out of bed to yes. know that you can help people where you are live a better life. And I think it aligns well, you know, with Caterpillar, where it's like we help our customers build a better, more sustainable world. Yes, it's it's in everything we do at Caterpillar, uh, whether it's oil and gas or you know resource industries or construction and we're building infrastructure or getting minerals out of the ground. All these things are required, right? So I, I look back and go, I, I find it really fortunate that I got snagged to, to join the cat team many years ago. That's awesome. Well, fist bump to your family getting you out of bed in the morning. Uh, that's, uh, that's an important piece that a lot of people put the job before the family, right? But in the end, at the end of the day, you don't have the job unless you got the family, and uh, they are they are what we do this for. And I love the uh, the passion of you know your your drive is to really be able to unlock these technologies is the way I'm kind of taking it to mm -hmm. be able to harness that and proliferate throughout the world to unlock it for other you know populations and countries. Yeah. Uh, I think we take that for granted so much and. Young kids, you know, especially in today's day and age, they just kind of flip on the lights. They, you know, get on their Twitter, their TikTok or whatever it is. And it's like, yeah, just it all happens. But yeah. there's so much in the background process wise that actually drives that electricity, that information be transferred for them to, you know, be able to do the things that, you know, they do in their daily lives. It's, it's really cool. Absolutely. It's really cool. So shifting to, um, I, I took a couple of notes here that I wanted to get out. And I apologize, I'm being rude and looking at my phone. I just no. wanted to make sure. It's been a busy week at the Thrive <laughs> Conference, man. It's been great, though. Um, it I it know. has been. Yeah, some really great speakers, insights Absolutely. on the industry. There is more horsepower in this one building than I think any other conference that exists uh, in the world that, that actually is meaningfully doing things for the industry. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah, great minds here. It is. So something I'm interested in, what are some of the technologies CAT has deployed recently, which are you know contributing to some sustainability initiatives that you guys want to chat about? Yeah, definitely. So when we think about Caterpillar, we, we, we break the industry into kind of four segments that we serve, right? There's drilling, there is well service or completion, then there is gas compression and production power. So one of the big ones that we did most recently here and rolled out and had a big push on was the G3600, which is our gas mm -hmm. compression um, platform that is used pretty much industry-wide. Um, it's a go-to name for compression. And, yeah. and so with the focus on, you know, be it the IRA with methane reduction, or just general emissions reduction, we've evolved that product over the last 30 plus years to where it is now. And we call it the A4 Gen 2 product. Okay. And in that, we've reduced methane emissions by over 40%. Wow. We've increased power density, and we've reduced all the other constituents down in that product, which has been really, really great to see. Um, and additionally, you know, most of those assets that we've ever sold and uh, put into the field to, to move the gas through the network, um, are still running. So 90 plus percent of those are still out there, 8,500 plus engines. And this technology is 100% retrofittable. So when you wow. think about the impact of that technology, it's not just a go forward thing. It's also a retrofittability thing because we know these assets are going to continue to run. We've got decades of life left in them, right? So that's, that's a pretty cool. exciting one we have here recently. That's really neat. So customers essentially future proof with their current installation, updating the prime mover. That's right. Get more power, you know, better efficiency. I presume also, you know, a lot of people want to adopt new technology, right? Mm -hmm. But 
at the end of the day, it has to pencil out from a total cost of ownership perspective. Right. Tell me a little bit about when you end up doing these improvements to these engines, you get better efficiency. What does that do for the TCO? Are you seeing better time before overhaul, less maintenance cycles? What does that look like? Yeah, on that particular product, I mean, it's really interesting because you, you're exactly right. You have these huge capital uh, installed base, right? And so you're like, well, I can't just continually throw away my old technology and just buy whatever's new and upcoming. Yep. So in this case, you know, we think about that when we're coming out with new product. And in this case, 100% retrofitable during major intervention, it, it's essentially the same cost as a normal rebuild. So there's no incremental or so very they're little, neutral. They're, very they're neutral. practically neutral. It, yeah. And That's, at the same wow. time, with that increase in power, um, the fuel efficiency actually improved sure. also. So you get less CO2E when you think about it, yep. certainly from the methane, but also from the overall fuel efficiency of that improvement. So that's that's a pretty good headline in that space, right? But yeah. certainly the other segments, we've got cool new advances that are coming along too. Tell me about it. Okay. So obviously we're here at uh, Daniel Energy's uh, Thrive, which is heavily well-service focused, but has yeah. nicely expanded to, to all of them. But in the frac space, you know, uh, DGB, which is dynamic gas blending, Caterpillar technology. Um, we introduced that years ago, even on a tier two diesel engine. Yep. And we've advanced that over the years. Uh, you know, early days, we would call it a, a more simple fumigated solution. Yep. And it's gone to multi-port injected. So you can control that. You can increase the displacement of mm -hmm. diesel. You can increase the thermal efficiency of the engine. So, you know, our tier four, 3512E was introduced in uh, um, 2015. Yep. And then in 2019, we introduced that DGB solution on that engine, which has been widely accepted, I'd say, and, yeah. and pretty industry leading. The cool thing is we're continuing to invest in that. So right now we're out under trial with an update to that. Okay. Software only type update, okay. which improves the diesel displacement up so we're already achieving you know we have customers achieving more than 70 percent diesel displaced regularly and across the whole fleet we're north of 60 percent wow. on all the assets that we have deployed which is fantastic um, but we're going to take that even higher with this new software and at the same time uh, increasing the thermal efficiency of the engine to the tune of uh, you know five plus percent improvement wow. which wow. is I think pretty awesome. That is awesome. And a lot of credit to our engineers who are in the lab, you know, working all these recipes, trying to understand how we deliver more value to the customer. No, that's awesome. And and to that point, you know, that that seems to be one of the biggest drivers, I think, for the industry right now um, that, that I see is how do you extract as much out of a single molecule as possible mm -hmm. to where when it's combusted, you're getting the maximum amount of power, the maximum amount of usage with the least amount of waste, for lack of a better term, yeah. I, outside of heat, because heat is just something that is in a, a tappable, but usually in the well servicing and drilling market, right? We yeah. go down a Rubble. rabbit hole on that. Um, what, do, what are you seeing in just the pure gas side of it um, that that CAT has is, is got out in the market and sees as kind of uh, a mix or, uh, you know, a couple of products that you'd like to highlight or talk about? Yeah, I mean, everybody wants to talk about gas these days, no oh, yeah. doubt. Yeah, I mean, you guys are talking about it, and uh, it's how do I take this plentiful, abundant, clean-burning fuel yep. and do the work I need to do with it? And I think, you know, that's, that's right in our wheelhouse. We've been doing that for years. Um, certainly, you can turn that natural gas particle into an electron, mm -hmm. um, and we have the technologies to do that across the board. Uh, we've got quite a few of them out there right now with this G3520, uh, 2.5 megawatt, uh, non-road mobile certified product, mm -hmm. very mobile. Uh, so when you're talking about high power intensity, like a hydraulic frac spread, needing that mobile power plant, um, but has great altitude capability and ambient capability and turn down capability to shed load. It's been working great in that application. So we've got a, a good installed base of those running around daily powering the oil field. But, you know, it can be used in any application. It's not yeah. just well service necessarily focused. You could sure. port that over to drilling. You can port it over to all kinds of different applications in that space. So that one's been a fun one to watch. And I think, you know, 
there's there's a desire across all of the products to continue to increase power density, thermal efficiency, fuel flexibility. Those are the common themes that keep coming up, right? Yep. And so combustion technology, I think, will continue to to advance in those spaces. And you know, it's not a one size fits all. No. Different customers have different needs. They have different fuel qualities. They have different mobility needs. Yes. So you got to you got to be able to put that together into a solution. I agree. Uh, I, I'm I'm a firm believer in agnostic approach to a customer's application until you have the data points you need to actually back calculate what's important to you, right? Like mm -hmm. if you got high methane number gas, right? You you want power density, you know, there's all these different like qualifying questions you can ask a customer to figure out at the end of the day, what's the best recipe mm -hmm. for that solution, right? And I know you and I unpacked this the other night, you know, like, hey, if you got low methane number gas, high BTU, right? That makes it really tough to use in some cases like a very high efficiency engine that, that requires, you know, much higher methane number. So what do you what do you see in kind of in that mixture if a customer wants to, you know, have a lower methane number gas, maybe they're gonna sacrifice some power and maybe a little bit of efficiency for that. Um, how do you guys go about kind of talking to a customer about selecting the right technology? Yeah, I, it's usually four qualities that I'll I'll throw out there in a customer open-ended conversation and go, engineering's about trade-offs typically, right? Yep. I always challenge a team to say it's not an or, it's an and, because yep. I want both. But realistically, physics is physics, right? Oh, it absolutely is. You when can't. I decide to, when I figure out how to overcome it, I'm not going to be doing a podcast nor being at, you know, the company I'm at right now. I'm going to be having an island sitting out in the middle of Bermuda or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like that plan. <laughs> Invite me over. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, do you care about Efficiency, fuel flexibility, power density, or performance, i.e. Yep. load acceptance and things like that. And it, it's no one for one. It's it's a blend. Yep. And so you got to say, how do I thread the needle on all that, right? And I mean, the same challenges come up. I'll just go back in time. You know, you look at tier four, yep. right? Our tier four solution doesn't require urea. We heard loud and clear from our customers, we don't want urea on our trailers. Yep, it's a pain to deal with. It's a pain to deal with, right? And so we figured out a way to do that and thread the needle to say we can meet the emissions requirement. There's some trade-offs in that. Yep. And with an EGR solution yes. and meet the needs. Yeah, you're gonna have a little more heat rejection to make it happen, right? But you eliminate this problematic urea that customers didn't want to use in a dirty, dusty environment and manage, right? And so Absolutely. those are the open conversations we need to have when doing product definition. Um, you know, I have a whole team of, of product definition folks that go deep into our customers' like business to understand those trade-offs to make sure that when we make these large investments, because they're multi-year programs, right? Oh, yeah. These are not, hey, two months later, I can crank out some new technology, right? These, oh. these take hundreds of man hours type thing to, to introduce some of these technologies. And so you really got to tie it back and understand it. No, I love it. What do you see in kind of continuing that, that route? Like we have seen these, these fuels kind of transition over the years, right? So diesel has primarily been the prime fuel source mm -hmm. in oil and gas, yep. natural gas. Now, thankfully is, you know, being well adopted across multiple different technologies, what are you seeing as kind of some of the, the next steps on technologies related to hydrogen? Is there anything just from like a 30,000 foot view sure. that you guys are, you know, working on or see as Segway products or solutions to be able to facilitate customers to use that fuel considering they can get their hands on it, right? Because yeah. there's a little bit of hair on hydrogen being able to be readily accessed in the market, yeah. even though it's a really cool technology, right? Yeah, definitely. So... I mean, that, that's the neat thing with, with Caterpillar. You know, we think about it in terms of solutions. We have building block technologies across industries. So even looking at, back to our frack transmission, right? Mm -hmm. That didn't come out of like, let's get into the frack transmission business, right? Yep. That transmission was already 30 years old. Correct. And ported over from a, a mining truck, right? And so some of the technologies in our suite include hydrogen capability. Like today we have a 100% hydrogen solution 
in a reciprocating engine mm -hmm. that's available on our electric power side. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a kind of a design to order type thing. It's 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 niche. Yeah. And we got that going on. But 25%, that's right off our quote price list, right? That is a readily available technology that's being deployed uh, in terms of that. But then you can also switch to things like hydrogen fuel cells. We just had a, sure. a press announcement here last uh, month uh, partnering with Ballard to create a um, energy backup solution for data center. Got it. Where you can do 48 hours of backup with uh, hydrogen fuel cell, ESS, microgrid controller. Yep. Caterpillar brings that technology to, to play where we can control that whole microgrid. And that same technology, we can bring that right over, and I've already started to, into things like hybrid drilling. Sure. And we've been doing that for a couple of years now where we take either a, a diesel engine, a DGB engine, a gas recip engine, pair it together with ESS, have a controller, and you can start to put that engine in a really sweet operational space. Yep. So you can eke out a couple more percent of efficiency. Absolutely. On it. Maybe you can drop an engine because you got three engines out there. Maybe you can drop two engines. And so you start to see the pull through on emissions reduction, fuel consumption. You know, you can drop 15% fuel consumption just by managing your loads better as a power system, mm -hmm. not as individual components. And I think that's where we really start to unlock the technology Yep. or unlock the, the power of integrating because it's not only about generating power, it's about using the power efficiently. Yes, absolutely. Right? And so that can't be done at just this level. No. You've got to bring it together. And anyway, Caterpillar's got that suite that we can pull across all industries to do that. And you see it even in our own machine applications, right? So we're starting to move into battery electric vehicles. Yep. We've got a, we've done a demo of a of a 240 ton haul truck that's battery electric, um, and that's all cat in house technology. Um, we've got diesel hybrid in mm -hmm. like a D6 XE or D11 XE, where you're managing that power. You're you're producing it at the lowest possible or the best possible efficiency point and then managing it through the motors. We've got the motor and the drive technology all in the portfolio of CAT. So it's really fun to talk to customers and, and help them to understand that it's not just about an engine anymore. Yeah. It's about a solution that delivers uh, work at the end of the day. That's awesome. Do you see um, anything in the – so you brought up the motor and drive technology, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see that coming into play inside of the oil and gas space as well? Because you think about electric frack, right? Mm -hmm. you got VFDs, motors. That VFD replaces what traditionally would be a transmission to go ahead and adjust frequency so you can control that speed, mm -hmm. obviously, on that electric motor, else it just runs constant speed at – you know, whatever it's rated at, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you guys see those? Are you considering those technologies as, you know, entry points into gas compression, electric frack, drilling applications? Yeah, yeah. So I'll start with gas compression, actually, because we've been in the electric motor space for compression for years already. So we actually have a line of gas compression motors, induction motors that are available. So we've been selling those since 2015. Okay. Um, so we're already in that space there. As we think about you know, where does it play out? Again, I think strategically it's, we have the technologies at CAT. And so when it's a good synergy with what we're already doing, that's an area where we can provide value to the customer. And if it's not, you know, it's not. Sure. Um, but we like to have in those conversations because I think there is overlap um, where we can we can be a partner with, with some of these customers. Very cool. Are you seeing more of the motor technology being adopted today? Because, you know, Go back to 2015, mm -hmm. definitely motors have been in the market, right? Yeah. But the infrastructure, I think, has always been a limiting factor mm -hmm. to being able to adopt a lot of that technology. And you hear about, you know, pressures on the grid, utilities, right? Like that is something that I think in all fairness is making a lot of people stay up at night, um, especially in the Permian Basin. You know, I've got kind of data points where you're talking about 670 megawatts of power demand on just oil and gas today yeah. in the Permian Basin, strictly for oil and gas. 
And by 2027, there's these crazy numbers of like 1.5 gigawatts. Would you think about that? Or, you know, I, I, I overstepped like the uh, Back to the Future 1.2 gigawatts, you know? Yeah, we need Mr. Fusion on <laughs> exactly. the back of the uh, DeLorean here to get us there. <laughs> exactly. But those are, those are big numbers. And so, I yeah. mean, are, are y'all seeing that, you know, folks are kind of like debating, hey, is it, is it right for us to go with electric motor drive technology in the market because we feel power is something that, that is maybe not there for us to realize these really cool technologies that improve efficiency, reduce total cost of ownership? Is there something you could chat about that, Rodney? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's reliability, affordability, sustainability, right? Back yep. to that. And I think there is definitely a, we've heard it anyway, a, uh, hesitancy and a fear with is it reliable enough for the expectations of our customers i.e we need to get work done yep. and if we can't get access to it but yet at the same time there is energy right available and it is uh potentially usable in the application so i think you'll get into scenarios where you can leverage it when it's available but mm -hmm. still have the ability to do it yourself Got it. um and certainly We've even got product out there today that's paralleling with the grid and our engines, right? Got to it. allow that to happen. So again, it's another building block technology that we can help our customers with when they go, hey, we got a bunch of your engines out here, but we also have you know, X megawatt coming off the grid that we can tap into. Can you help us with that? Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about that because we can. That's awesome. So shifting the conversation, um, Something I, I, I wanted to kind of see if you'd like to do is, is there a, uh, I don't want to call it a shameless plug, but is there a passion project, something that, you know, you're really enthusiastic about, not necessarily work-related, could be uh, something personally that, that you'd like to plug on the show or uh, chat about really quick? You know, I'll just, I'll just pick something recent that me and my family have done. Um, certainly, I think giving back and um, helping the next generation is super important. Um, I consider myself super fortunate in the sense that my parents loved me well. They gave me some great opportunities as a child. They taught me what was important. And um, so we, we've partnered with World Vision here, you know, international organization that connects kids all over the world with donors here in the U.S. And I have four kids. So I, we actually I let each of my children kind of pick out a child that they wanted to sponsor. Mm. And so we just started that and, you know, you get the birthday request through and they're emailing back and forth and getting the letters. And it's really awesome to connect that next generation and yes. be really generous so that others have opportunities in the future. So, um, yeah, I'd really encourage that. Uh, Man, that is that is fantastic. And, and the um, at a very young age to be able to have like the humility and be humble to be willing to do that for another kid right especially as a child that teaches such good skills about in, in my opinion like people at the end of the day we got to take care of people and you know this world yeah. doesn't work without you know uh, putting a little love in for somebody else that doesn't have it as good as we do mm -hmm. so i um i applaud you for that man that's pretty fantastic we kind of went full circle. Yeah. What got me out of bed in the morning, helping people, lifting people, yes. connecting my kids back to that and realizing they have that responsibility in their generation too. So I definitely do. Rodney, it's been a fantastic conversation, my friend. I really appreciate the opportunity and having you come on the podcast. And uh, folks, if uh, you'd like to connect with Rodney on LinkedIn, Rodney on LinkedIn. You bet. Look him up. Uh, you got a LinkedIn profile you want to drop. Yeah, on the, uh, we'll put it down put there it down in the there. link. Okay, awesome. We'll Absolutely. go ahead and put it on and appreciate everybody joining us for the Energy Espresso. Check in with us next week and uh, keep drinking coffee and uh, having the energy industry drive us. <laughs>